We're in a series called, of course, Boot Camp Discipleship. We focus on what we can do individually to uh, the, the lifelong process, help us along the lifelong process of moving away from consumer Christianity more toward discipleship Christianity. But we always have to note that's not a singular individual process. You never go to boot camp of one. You go to a boot camp with other recruits. And part of the learning you get and the training you get is how to live as a team. This is what Jesus is telling his team of recruits in the passage you're just about to hear Stephanie read. A few weeks ago, we started the series with the graduation exercise Jesus gave us, where he took a towel, wrapped it around himself, and washed his disciples' feet. Now let us hear what Jesus said immediately after this to his recruits. From the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. Here's a tip for reading the Bible. If Jesus ever repeated himself, look very carefully at what he's repeating. And if he ever repeats himself twice, stop and really ask yourself, why is he doing this? Because Jesus, in that passage, just said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Even as I have loved you, you must love one another. By this, all people will know that you're my disciple if you heard that before, have you? It's key, it's core, it's essential. He is trying to drill it in by rote memory. But how would those disciples, that team of recruits, if you will, now that they're just about to graduate boot camp, how are they going to concretely, practically show love for one another in such a way that it would embody what the church would be for millennia? How do you love one another? Well, I'm going to give you a couple of illustrations that I think get to the nitty-gritty of such love. And the first comes from a movie that some of you might have seen a long time ago. It was when Richard Gere had black hair. (laughs) An officer and a gentleman. He is a Navy recruit in boot camp by the name of Mayo, and he is wanting to fly jets. He is in this boot camp only for himself to get through it because he is self-centered, self-absorbed. It's all about him and his goals. Well, like any good boot camp, that uh, me first attitude gets shaved down and down and down and down. Until finally, toward the end of the movie, there's a scene in the obstacle course. And Mayo has a really good uh, athletic uh, ability. And everyone knows he's going to break the record for completing the obstacle course. Everybody's cheering him on. Everybody's excited about it. And he takes off. And there he goes. He faces and overcomes one hurdle, faces overcomes another hurdle, until he gets to this wall, a vertical wall with a rope hanging down. And the idea is that you're supposed to grab hold of the, the rope and pull yourself up, walking the wall until you get to the other side. He does it flawlessly, walking the wall, but the recruit next to him is having difficulty. She's struggling, struggling, and finally falls back onto the ground, and there are tears of frustration because she knows that if she doesn't complete the wall, no matter how hard she's worked in boot camp, she's not going to graduate. Well, tough luck. Every person for themselves, right? He continues 
uh, on to the next obstacle, but you see him have a little different expression on his face, and he stops, and he goes back, and he says to this recruit, Seeger, get up. We're going to walk this wall together. Get up. And he sh- she gets up, and together he shows her one, one hand over another, one step after another. Come on, Seeger, you can do it. You can do it. Finally, she does it. And uh, they go, they, they uh, complete the wall. And then with this great uh, expression of relief on her face, together they complete the obstacle course as they run it and do it together. I love that image of someone going past what would have made them look good, their own goal, their own pride and ego, going back to help a teammate. And what did Jesus say? A new commandment I give you that you... Here's a second illustration of how do you practically love someone. I will not ask you to show your age I will not ask you to show your age by raising your hand if you've ever had a croquet set. Won't do that. Look at this. I told you not to do that because no one has them anymore. I looked for one. I couldn't find any of them. It's one of those old lawn games where uh, if you've never played it, you have these wooden, colorful little wooden balls and you hit it with a wooden mallet and you, you hit the ball through a series of wire hoops in the ground or wickets until you get to a wooden stake. You hit the wooden stake with the ball, and you go back through. First one completing that wins. Well, I give you this little trip down memory lane to tell you about a long time ago, and this is true, of course, that in the rainforest of the Philippines, there is this tribe of primitive folks who've never been touched by, by modern society. And these missionaries here, I guess it was a missionary couple, they were teaching the tribesmen the game of croquet. And as they were playing, as the tribe's folks were playing, one of them hit the ball next to another one. What happens when your ball lands next to an opponent's ball? That's right. In a good Christian way, you whack it, don't you? (laughs) You put your foot on the ball, you take your mallet, and you show the laws of physics. Every action results in an equal and opposite reaction. You send your opponent's ball into oblivion. This is called fun. (laughs) But when the missionary explained it to this tribesman who had hit his ball next to the other one, this puzzled expression came across the man's face. Why would I want to do that? Because you can now win the game. And It was a revelation to the missionaries because, you see, that society has no sense of competition. Rather, their whole society was built on cooperation, not one person winning, but on everybody working together for a common goal. So he ignored the missionaries' advice. As a matter of fact, all the other tribes people did too. And when one person won, instead of saying, yay, look at me, they went back to help the other team or the other uh, tribesmen people go through their wickets to get to the game. And then finally, when the last one completed it, they all went together, we won. We won. That is how you love one another in Christ. Because as we, as Kevin led you in the call to worship, we all come from separate places. But in this place, we're in one place with one Lord, and we love in one way. We drop our mallet. It's not about me and what I want. It's about serving one another, dropping the pride, loving one another. And we will have reached that point when someone who has five great-grandchildren sitting in the back of this church sees uh, a young family at the baptizing of their first infant, and that great-grandparent couple says, how can I help them? raise their child. We will have come to loving one another when newlyweds will hear of a 
woman who is standing by the grave of her husband of 53 years, and these newlyweds say, how can I reach out and care for that widow? It's always about the other person, period. So, I'm going to give us two very concrete, easy, well, maybe not easy, two very concrete, simple ways of demonstrating this type of love right here, right now. It's going to make you feel a bit uncomfortable this first way, but I'm your pastor, so tough. (laughs) Would you please stand? Would you please assume the prayerful respect position, and I want you, maybe you can turn around to somebody, or you can go somebody to somebody, and I want you to say, I'll pick on Kevin again, it was so fun earlier, (laughs) two words, thank you. What are you waiting for? And thank you. You may be seated. Do you know what you just did? You went up to someone and you said, thank you so I don't have to worship alone. Thank you for joining me in prayer for this old world. Thank you for giving an offering so that we can continue worshiping together. Do you know how refreshing it is to acknowledge somebody with a simple thank you? Before you leave this place today, you pick out someone to thank. Someone in the choir, someone who is, will be seated, uh, seated around the caring ministries table, maybe a custodian who opened up everything today, somebody in a red shirt that greeted you. Do you understand the power of a thank you? You're not focusing on what you're getting or what you did. You're focusing on someone else. And that makes all the difference. That's one concrete way of being the team. Second concrete way, and don't worry, there's no exercise involved in this, is to simply encourage someone. And by that I mean follow your heart. When your heart goes out to someone, that is God's way of nudging you to make a difference in that person's life. Let me tell you what I mean. There were two people, great friends, one on either side of the Atlantic. And one friend received a letter from the other that was heartbreaking. She wrote that her husband of many years had left her and she was forced to go on alone now raising two teenage kids. She was heartbroken, she didn't know what to do. And her friend receiving the letter was heartbroken. She didn't I mean, she could pray, but what good does that do? So she sat down and just wrote out whatever came to her mind. And she sealed it up, trying, hoping that these were words of encouragement, sent it on. Two weeks later, she got a letter back from her friend. And her friend in the letter said, On the day I received your letter, I was standing over the sink, doing dishes, crying. And somehow there was a small voice in my mind that said simply, lean on me, I'll support you, I'll be your strength. And that gave me the best feeling of maybe there is hope. And then your letter came that afternoon and I read it, and do you know what you wrote in it? You said, God is with you, lean on him, he will support you, He will be your strength. And I knew then, this is God talking to me. You want to do a miracle? Pastor Winter at 930 preached about Jesus healing. You want to heal somebody? You let Jesus heal through you when you simply let your heart go forth and let God speak through you to encourage someone. That's how you be the team. After this service, you're going to uh, pass 
some tables that will illustrate some of the intentional ways this church reaches out to care for one another, for dropping the croquet mallet, for going back to someone who is failing the obstacle course. You're going to see uh, some of these many ministries demonstrated. Stephen ministry, visitation care ministry, prayer card ministry, prayer chain ministry, prayers for God's people ministry, concerns of the day, grief share, divorce care, prayer shawl ministry, greeting card ministry, Tuesday morning prayer team. You'll see the welcome team ministry where you'll sign up and funeral meal ministry. And I'm sure we've left out some. Stop by because you might need one of those ministries, or you might know someone in need of one of those ministries, or you might need to serve through one of those ministries. But whatever you do, please know this, that when you love as Christ is calling us to love one another, life will never be the same. We ever do that in this church totally like this? Well, you know what we'll need to do? We will need to build more barracks. We're going to move into the ultimate expression of how Christ loves us, sacrificed for us, and how we should love and sacrifice for one another. It's through the gift that we will receive of communion. But Pastor Stephanie and I are going to wear another stole to serve you communion. And as you come up and take communion, I want you to see this stole and remember that this is an expression of the love that this church has for you and for others. This is a prayer shawl knitted by many gifted people and caring people in this church. We have a collection of them in the office and whenever pastors or others go forth to a hospital visit or to someone in need, we'll take one. And one of the neatest things I will always remember in my ministry is when I visit someone in the hospital and when I enter the room, they're under a shawl like this, a shawl that has a tag that says, Love and Prayers, Manchester United Methodist Church. This will help warm the body, but it will especially warm the heart. Thanks to you.